six three so uh well let, let's uh, start and uh, as people are arriving so i'll uh, welcome everybody good afternoon i'm uh, i'm paul rodriguez and it's uh, from Kimenta, and it's a, a real pleasure to be uh, here today and hosting this uh, webinar with uh, some fantastic panelists that have been been working together so this today's uh, session is about the, um, the effects of covid19 on, on people with uh, with multiple sclerosis and uh, we're going to be talking with uh, with uh, you know, these this great people here about like uh, uh, the global data sharing initiative and uh, how um, how what's the work that has been done there as as this pandemic is is unfolding and you now right now actually I was just looking at the numbers there's already 12 million people affected by covid in the world and um, you know, it's affecting every everybody in, in one way or the, or the other and uh, you know, there's the, a great demand for data uh, and to look at the impacts of, of COVID, of the virus on, on different people, but particularly on, on uh, MS, on people with MS. So, um, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm proud to, to be here and to be moderating as much as, as possible, like these, uh, the, you know, the three panelists that we have here, and uh, also like everybody in the, in the audience, in the attendees, if uh, there will be also a, an opportunity for questions from everybody. So, um, well, let me start by, by briefly introducing our, our panelists. So I'm, uh, I'm here today with, uh, with Dr. Elizabeth Peters. Uh, she's the professor of biomedical data science in Hasselt University and the chair of the MS Data uh, Alliance Initiative. We also have Dr. Claire Walton, and she's the head of research and access uh, of the MS International Federation. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Paolo Villaslada, uh, as well here as a neurologist, professor, as an adjunct professor in, at Stanford, and has been working, what, more than 20 years in, uh, in contributing to the, to the development of uh, biomarkers and new therapies for uh, multiple sclerosis. So we have like a very rich set of, of uh, minds here. So, um, well, the way that, that this will work, like we'll start with a, you know, a brief presentation by, by Elizabeth and, and Claire about the initiative. Uh, and then and they will give us an overview of, of the initiative, the status, and then we'll jump to the, to the panel discussion. Um, so we will also be launching right now, uh, um, uh, right now a questionnaire just to have an idea of the audience. So like what, what's the, the scope of, of the, the attendees here? And also would like to mention that at, at any moment, and I, I believe that after the presentation and during the final discussion, everybody can also launch questions with the option in the, you know, in Zoom below, right, you can make your questions and I'll do my best to, to accommodate all the questions given the, the, the time that we have here. So I think that's, that's it for the logistics. Ah, here we have the, the questionnaire. So uh, without, you know, delaying and, and spending more time in the, the not that interesting <laughs> uh, parts i'll give the the virtual uh, screen to the to claire and to lisbeth thanks paolo um hi everybody it's really great to uh, be talking to you today i was just going to give a very brief introduction to the reason behind setting up this initiative um when the first cases of coronavirus uh, started appearing in italy and, and in europe um, MSIF members. So we are an organization um, of 48 MS patient organizations around the world and both, uh, both us and our members started to get questions, lots of questions from really concerned people with MS who wanted to know what it meant for them. They wanted to know were they at greater risk of catching COVID um, or of having poor outcomes, of being hospitalized, of dying of COVID. And there were also lots of questions around the medications they were on. So, you know, as, as we know, lots of um, disease modifying therapies for MS are immunosuppressive or immunomodulatory and people really wanted to know what would that mean for them and, and catching COVID and, and COVID severity. So we convened a group of international um, MS neurologists and research experts to come up with some global advice for people with MS and at the time, this was at the beginning of March, it was very, very apparent that we just needed more data. So the global advice was based on clinical opinion, based on what we already knew um, the different DMTs uh, therapies do in terms of other infections, but of course we knew nothing about COVID. At the time, there were um, three cases um, of coronavirus in people with MS in Italy, and, and it was just really not enough to go on. So we quite uh, quick, we moved quickly. There were two very uh, obvious needs. One, we needed to collect 
good quality data in people with MS to see what the uh, COVID outcomes and prognosis was. Um, but the of other really obvious thing was that it needed to be global because there were not enough cases in each country developing um, for us really to have the kind of insights we needed to inform clinical practice. So that's when we reached out to Elizabeth, um, the chair of the MS Data Alliance, to start to think about how we could rapidly uh, mobilize MS registries and the MS community to um, collect data in a way that we could harmonize and share and uh, really start to get insights on what this virus means for people with MS during the pandemic so people could be informed as soon as possible. Um, I'll, I'll pass over to Elizabeth to tell you more about how we, we did that. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I, pre I prepared a short presentation because otherwise it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to follow the flow. Uh, so Claire already gave a very good introduction indeed on, on the atmosphere, how all of this started, right? So it was about mid-March, end of March, uh, where indeed this need for um, answers to urgent questions that that everything related uh, the effect of COVID-19 in people with MS uh, to actually scale up as soon as possible um, and, and also get answers from that uh, data collection. Uh, and that's why we actually jointly set up this global data sharing initiative uh, where we had a very simple mission, uh, so which, which immediately aligned all interests of, of, of everyone involved that to get answers quick uh, because the questions were urgent uh, and, and of course, we needed uh, insights very rapidly. So we focused on three major objectives. Uh, first of all, indeed, to scale up uh, the collection of, uh, of data with a specific focus on COVID-19, uh, but also immediately to use that data to achieve insights, uh, to support care, uh, potentially still during the pandemic. Um, and then, of course, at the same time, we were very aware in the beginning um, that, that, of course, collaborative research is slow. Um, it, the cases are rare. Uh, so, so, of course, we would specifically would like to act as a stimulus for future scientific research uh, in the meantime and, and therefore to make it as sustainable as possible. Um, so that's why actually a number of uh, project partners teamed up quite rapidly, uh, shortly after that call to action of MSIF, uh, where indeed several partners of the MS Data Alliance and the MS International Federation contributed with all their personnel um, to actually get this going. And, and it was actually QMENTA who kindly offered and provided their platform uh, to support this mission, uh, I guess, immediately after I asked them. So I still would like to thank them um, for doing that because it has been a major contribution to making this work. Uh, so, and when we say we, what do we mean? Uh, so it's actually a set of indeed some people who are doing the daily, daily coordination and the operational work, but at the heart of the initiative, of course, it's our data partners. So it's our uh, local data custodians who are advocating for, for local data collection uh, and who are actually doing the heavy lifting in the data collection and then sharing it with the global data sharing initiative. Uh, and this map actually clearly shows how global it, it, it is. Uh, so we currently have uh, different data partners who are actively involved. They're all in different stages of uh, involvement, but they're all very motivated and willing to be on board. Um, and, and they come actually from all the continents across, across the globe. So it has been a major success uh, how, how the MS community came together to actually uh, accomplish this mission jointly. Um, and of course, uh, we would like to thank our sponsors and funders who, who made it possible to at least cover some of the baseline budget to do so. Uh, so as already mentioned, we have three major objectives. Uh, I will touch upon very briefly on all of that, so just to set the scene, and then we can do the panel debate afterwards. So the first one, which was definitely the most important one in the beginning, is to scale up COVID-19 data collection efforts. Uh, because indeed, mid-March and March, there were these separate parallel initiatives that were arising. Uh, but actually, everybody was just starting to collect data, but it was very um, poorly aligned because everything had to happen so quickly uh, and specifically because of the immediate response of MSIF to actually think about the idea, let's at least try to align from the beginning onwards and try to come up with at least uh, a, a core data set uh, 
uh, to, to actually harmonize that as soon as possible. And then to actually scale up as soon as possible by activating as many different people involved. And again, MSIF took, took the lead in activating globally through their network. Um, and um, so actually, what do we mean with this core data set? Uh, so we don't have to go into detail, but it's quite important that uh, the, the variables that we are currently looking at were highly driven by the research questions that were most urgent at that time. Uh, so we selected based on uh, different inputs, some research questions or, or, or very intuitive questions that people with MS raised early on in the pandemic, where answers to these questions were very urgent. And, and, and questions included, of course, uh, does MS increase my chance to have a se severe COVID-19 infection? Um, should I stop or switch my current TMT because of the risk of COVID-19? So those were all very intuitive questions. And based on those questions, we selected some variables, which at that point we felt these are uh, at least the minimal amount of variables we should be collecting to perform proper research to address these questions already early on in the pandemic, but also afterwards. Um, and then uh, we actually encouraged as many different registries across the globe to start implementing that COVID-19 data set. Because we believe that data collection is highly locally driven. When you have local advocates, for example, if you, we have very motivated people in Latin America that are actually taking up uh, in, 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 in Spanish and in Portuguese, the communication with people with MS and with clinician, that is much more effective than if you would have a global platform with only one language and only one opportunity. So we really felt that we should activate the community and specifically empower the, the, the people who were already motivated and willing to team up with us because we, we only had limited resources. And that's also why I would like to stress again in this um, um, public debate that everyone has a responsibility in this story, right? That everybody should feel personally responsible um, because whether you're a person with MS or a clinician or if you are representing an umbrella organization within the field of MS, uh, everybody can contribute to this mission. If you're a person with MS, you can start collecting data similarly as a clinician. So, and we really urge for, this, for an urgent call to action to start uh, collecting COVID-19 cases. So specifically clinicians um, who are um, in of their persons with MS that they are uh, treating, if they see that there is a suspected or confirmed case, we really urge them to go to one of the existing registry or the fast data entry platform, which is just when you go to the Cumenta website, you can immediately find you. It takes you less than five minutes to record a COVID-19 case, but it is really very important that we have all the cases we can find because it is still a rare event. Uh, Okay, so how does the Global Data Sharing Initiative work? Without digging too much into detail, uh, we try to come up with an infrastructure that allows every single record to be in, in one way or the other. So we actually said that the technology should be to actually facilitate the mission and it should not be about the technology itself. And that's why it's a little bit a mix of everything. <laughs> it's just because we wanted to have it very flexible. So we actually have three major ways you can contribute. You can contribute directly into the platform, which um, and when you go to the website, you can immediately click it, or you can participate via one of the participating registries. And for example, if you contribute in uh, the German MS registry, then those registries are participating in the global data sharing initiative by sharing their data, either just patient level or what we call aggregated data sharing, which is actually just a, a complicated word for some summary statistics, right? So we don't have to go much more into detail. So where are we now? Um, so we currently differentiate the data between clean, data that is reported by clinicians or data that is reported by patient directly. Um, and we, because we have seen from the preliminary results that they, those two data sources behave very differently, we currently keep them separate. Uh, and I will show later why that is. Um, so we ha currently have a lot of patients that is 
um, reported by patients directly, so about 6,400 cases, and we have about 800 cases that our clinician reported. And if you can see that this actually comes from, uh, if I counted rapidly, eight different national initiatives or, or global initiatives, you can see that the individual cohorts who are actually already at the scale of a, a complete country usually, or for example, in Latin America, a whole continent, uh, that still the cases are quite low in the individual cohorts. And that is specifically the reason why a global data sharing initiative is required because the individual cohorts are too small by themselves to actually read significant power and, and, and get results. So if we scale up together, we can achieve about 800 cases. But even there, the number is still quite small. Uh, although it's global, uh, and that stresses again the importance for everybody feeling personally responsible of recording their own COVID-19 cases, or if you're a person with MS and you actually had COVID-19, we also urge you to start collecting your data. Um, so, of course, what people find most in, uh, interesting is, okay, what does the data say, right? And we focus on some very concrete, urgent research questions. Um, the first one is, does it seem like the COVID-19 outcomes are generally more severe in people with MS compared to the general population? Are there urgent risk uh, flags that we really have to know early on in the pandemic? Or, and is the pattern of risk factors similar to the general public? What do we mean? Um, are people with severe COVID-19 outcomes in general, also the people that are just from the general public also having severe outcomes. For example, we know from literature that uh, older age and, and so on is a risk factor. And then of course, there is great interest in seeing if there is a difference in how people are treated, whether or not they respond differently when they are infected with COVID-19. And actually it's quite exciting that we uh, will be able to already share some preliminary results from, uh, from the data set. Uh, and actually we, um, so from the large data core, what I just explained, we included uh, what we call COVID-19 suspected and confirmed cases. So we came up with a definition on how we define a COVID-19 case. For clinician, it's still quite intuitive. So when, when the clinician thinks it's a COVID-19 case, we label it as suspected. Whereas with the patient reported data, we included some additional uh, checks to, to really make sure that it's a highly suspected case. So we come up about 400, 600 cases in both cohorts. Um, and the, the first results, which are highly exploratory, but at least um, uh, interesting to look at, um, see that indeed, uh, when, because we said we differentiate between clinician reported and patient reported. Uh, so when people with MS report, it seems like um, they are less severe cases, which makes sense, of course. We always envisioned that would happen, that people who are in ICU, who are ventilated, uh, those will not be the people who will start recording their data just because of, because of fun of it, right? Uh, so we always envisioned that would happen. We didn't expect that the percentages would be uh, so low, but I, I think that's definitely uh, reassuring, right? So um, when we look at the percentages for hospitalized, about 1% of the suspected and confirmed cases were hospitalized, and we had no uh, uh, people in ICU or death when uh, patient reported. When clinician reported, where again, there is uh, an imperfect bias, uh, we can, we, we believe or, or, or we intuitively feel that clinicians are more eagerly to report very severe cases. Um, so again, there is a bias to, to more severe cases and, and, and that should also be mentioned to contextualize the percentages. Uh, so it seems like, uh, so 27 of the uh, reported cases were hospitalized, 8% were in ICU and 3% uh, of the cases were reported to have died of COVID-19. Um, so we don't really know if that is the exact number, of course, because there is a, uh, uh, an obvious bias in the reporting method, but at least those percentages are reassuring. Uh, it's more or less similar uh, to what is being reported for the general public, where the death rate is around 6%, 5%. Uh, so it, there doesn't seem to be a major risk uh, factor 
just because people have uh, MS. But of course, very similarly to the general public, with increased age, the risk for severe COVID-19 does seem to increase. So we can see that for people with MS with ages above 70, the, the death rate um, increases to 24%. And actually these trends of, of increased risk for severe outcomes is similar for hospitalization and, and ICU. And uh, similarly, again, to the general public, we can see, see that there are other risk factors that seem to increase uh, the risk for severe uh, outcomes. Um, so for example, gender um, has been reported already in literature to be a risk factor for COVID-19 severe outcomes. Uh, so here we show what we call a univariate uh, um, um, visualization of the effect of gender. Uh, and although that is a complicated word, what it means is, is that of course, now we're only looking at gender. Uh, across the different age factors, which means that there is not really a statistical modeling that is really proving that age has an effect, but it does show you the trend when you look at the data that there is slightly increased percentages, so a slightly increased risk uh, for, for male uh, people with MS. Whereas for MS type, that effect is much more visual with the naked eye. Um, so the blue dot is actually the line for pro people with progressive MS, so including primary progressive or secondary progressive MS, where the percentages of hospitalization are 61 versus 27 uh, of, the, uh, of the average. For ICU uh, stay, 20% versus 8%, and for death, 14% versus 3%. So it clearly showed that there is at least um, uh, the, that the hypothesis that progressive MS patients are at higher risk of severe COVID-19 is definitely worth testing with a statistical model. And we're currently doing all of these analysis and we'll come back with a scientific publication, hopefully rapidly after this webinar. Um, and then similarly for EDSS, we can see that people with an EDSS equal or above six um, are, at, uh, are showing higher percentages in hospitalization, ICU, say, and death. So again, here the blue dots are people with EDSS uh, equal or above six. Um, and the, the percentage of hospitalization is 60 versus 29, 70 versus nine for ICU stay and 16 versus four for, for death. So th there is a clear effect for, for EDSS. So, and of course, how we envision to have this moving forward is, is that indeed that it's, it's very clear that to reach the level of trustworthiness to answer questions related to individual DMT, um, we still need to scale up and further research is, is definitely necessary so that statistic analysis have to be improved. Uh, but then of course, from, from my own uh, perspective as a data scientist, I really feel that this is a very inspirational story for, for the MS community. So we have really shown that, that the community in its entirety can come together and adhere to unseen timelines uh, to achieve uh, joint results. So of course, currently uh, the results have to be properly contextualized which actually means that a lot of data is required because there are so many variables that can uh, have to be adjusted for. But we can see that if we align rapidly in the beginning on the research questions, collaborative research can clearly be fastened. Um, so that's it for, for the introduction. Uh, and of course, now we can take questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you, Elizabeth and, and Claire. Like, you know, great, great initiative. And, and it's really, you know, we see on the other side uh, all the effort behind it and in driving and, and rallying all these different stakeholders and everybody involved in it. And, but it's, you know, it's, it's showing the initial results. And, in, and I think it's, it's extremely motivating also, like, the, to show that data can indeed save lives and, and something to learn from and to, to extrapolate also for other initiatives, I, I think, for the other opportunities and uh, so uh, just to remind everybody that we can use the option like below in zoom uh, q a if you have any questions but i i can start with uh, you know you showed already some some results some initial you know, insights so um how are these insights or, or others like these learnings being being uh, you know extracted from the, the initiative how are they being uh, used or informing clinical practice 
maybe maybe Claire, if you if you can start. <laughs> uh, you're mute. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the prompt. Uh, yeah, so I talked at the beginning about um, the global advice that we had developed, MSIF had developed, um, and I think that's exactly how this data is, is informing clinical thinking because it was initially almost completely based on opinion, but we, we've been updating it as evidence has accumulated. So actually we're now on the third revision of that guidance um, and the first preliminary data that um, Elizabeth has presented today um, including actually some more preliminary data on um, disease modifying therapies have been presented to that uh, advice development group. And we also brought in the, um, there's a, another data initiative in Italy, the MUSC initiative, who um, have got similarly about 600 cases um, in total from Italy. So they also presented their um, unpublished data and together the insights that we are getting have informed the latest guidance. So. The real changes, um, I would say the first guidance was really cautious because we just didn't know and, and people thought that um, people with MS would be at a greater risk of severe outcomes and, and some disease modifying therapies. And as Lisbeth said, actually the data that's coming through is really reassuring that people do not seem to be at a greater risk of death um, than the general population. So the latest iteration of the advice has really you know, reduced some of that caution people are still very much advised to follow the who guidance but the kind of the extra level of caution that people should take is now only recommended for those in the higher risk groups that lisbeth just mentioned so people with higher ED edss people with progressive ms people over the age of 60 and potentially men although we we didn't include that in the advice um so yeah i think it's really and, and that's happened so quickly that i think it's really um encouraging to see how we can use this advice to update the guidance that, that clinicians are, are using around the world. Yeah, and uh, like the the Pablo, like the have you seen like any any changes or has the treatment of MS been changed during this pandemic? Like in beginning and and and, and what we see now, like related to you know, how data can inform these decisions. But have you seen changes in the way that uh, the patients are treated? Yeah, definitely. Meaning, uh, I would say that this uh, has been a great exercise and this kind of information has been pivotal in order to change our perception. Let's say that at the beginning of the epidemic, we were highly concerned about patients with MS because several other issues. First, disabilities. Of course, we were uh, concerned about the, this disab the disabilities of patients may be predisposed to higher level of risk. Second, because the use of therapies. And third, because the underlying disease, the autoimmunity that may be exacerbated by the infection itself, because we know this, the tie link between infections and immune responses and uh, relapses and, and inflammation as a whole. Uh, you know, it's amazing how uh, quickly um, our understanding has evolved. I remember in March, we were saying, oh, we need to delay treatment. Treatment may put at risk on patients. Just one a month later, maybe a couple of months later, now we have realized that is not true, and even the contrary. Patients receiving therapies and doing better. Uh, let's say we need to put this in context, okay? Uh, it's true that patients not receiving therapies maybe are a little bit of higher risk, but the reason of that is because they are mainly progressive MS patients, meaning this is the first reason. But the second one is because uh, some of these therapies, not all of them, but may decrease the inflammatory response in the immune system in response to coronavirus, and by this way, there is a suspicion, not yet confirmed, that maybe some of them decrease the severity of the COVID symptoms, meaning that uh, the lesson that we have learned is that no, there is no additional risk by being treated at present in terms of the severity of the uh, infection. Another question, maybe the open question we can discuss later, is at the time of the vaccine, uh, when, when the vaccine is available. But at present, uh, I would say that what we have learned in the last three months, for example, is that patients with MS, uh, the, because having MS itself is not increasing the risk, but it's increasing the risk is disability, age, meaning being older, uh, obesity, and comorbidities, meaning you have cardiovascular diseases, for example, because a stroke is, and thrombosis is the most common uh, complication. Um, regarding therapies, we are, we are not seeing 
additional risk here, meaning seems to be safe. In addition, you know, different countries have adopted different strategies. In some countries, they delay the attendance to the, to the MS centers and receiving the infusion for the injectables. But in other countries, they didn't, uh, um, they didn't change anything and they keep uh, being treated with the, with the monoclonal antibodies, for example, meaning that I would say that at, at present, we can reassure patients that uh, you, uh, you, you know, by having MS or receiving therapy, they are not a higher risk of, the, of coronavirus in, uh, complications. And do you think like, uh, like do you see any, any trends or any possible implications for, for the future or, or, or that will be more like when there's a vaccine or when that topic appears? So like. Um, okay, implication for the future, we don't know. Meaning sometimes there are some uh, unexpected implications. For example, when you have more common infections, okay, this to some extent put at risk the population to some autoimmune diseases like MS, but at the same time, when you have very common infections, uh, you, let's say that you train your immune system and to some extent maybe you um, uh, may prevent or decrease the severity of MS. Okay, these are, could be long-term a uh, trend that uh, starting now, let's say in a few years, we are going to learn. But yes, probably uh, or for sure, the most important discussion right now, okay, first is to consolidate, consolidate the knowledge what I have said so far, meaning these trends of that therapies are not a problem and patients uh, by suffering MS are not a higher risk if you um, uh, are not taking account the, the, the other factors like, uh, like age and comorbidities. Mm. Vaccine, vaccination is going to be the challenge because we know for sure that some of these therapies, the most uh, efficacious therapies decrease the uh, efficacy but this not means, doesn't mean that they are not going to be vaccinated, meaning probably maybe they require additional doses or maybe some of the vaccines uh, work better in some individuals or in some treatment than others. Meaning it's going to be also it's going to require some learning process. The good thing is that we have tools to accelerate this learning mm -hmm. process, meaning you can monitor the response to the vaccine, meaning the antibodies, the serology, what everybody's expecting, and other aspects, other tests that we can do in order to understand whether the vaccination is, is, is doing the benefit that we expect. Mm. Now, we have a, a question from the, from the attendees and it's um, related to the, to the fact like different countries uh, uh, have different approaches in the, in the quarantine or, or in the lockdown. So the question is if you see uh, that uh, you know, are patients advised to quarantine more than the general population? Uh, because aren't they not already more cautious because they're on uh, immunosuppression? I, I would say that at the beginning, yes, we were a little bit extra cautious with our patients mm -hmm. in order to protect them. I would say that right now, based in this, uh, in this learning that we have achieved in these uh, two or three months, we would say that, uh, you know, we recommend our patients to do like any other, uh, anybody else, and any other person attending a medical center, meaning that uh, um, I would say that uh, we need to be cautious, of course, because it's serious, this, uh, the coronavirus infection, but I would say that we are not alarmed, like uh, maybe at the beginning mm -hmm. we, we could be. I, I can speak to the global advice if it's helpful. So we, um, we recommend, you know, just because you have MS, you shouldn't necessarily um, do much more than the WHO advice in terms of hand washing, um, social distancing, <clears throat> wearing face masks. But we do also recommend um, to try to limit in in-person routine hospital appointments if there are telephone um, or remote options available. Um, and we also recommend to try to avoid um, public transport if you can. Um, so I think it's it, it's we still have sensible recommendations. Um, that we would for anyone with potentially increased um, comorbidities and some of the risk factors we talked about. But as, as Pablo said, it's not, uh, you know, we're, we're now not recommending that people need to be completely isolated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the, maybe for, for Lisbeth, like from what we see now, like from the data that you have in the, in the initiative, like what are the, the questions that are still unanswered? Uh, really to COVID and MS, like what, what is needed more? What, what other data or research efforts are, are needed to answer this? 
Um, yeah, so first of all, um, we didn't touch upon uh, actually the, the, the risk of individual DMT groups, uh, even if we can group them on based of mode of action or, um, or, or even at the individual uh, uh, DMT risk. Uh, so that is definitely something where the analysis are still ongoing. Uh, so, so to actually see if whether the signal uh, if, if there is a signal, if the signal is valid, if the signal is stable, if it is trustworthy. So that's definitely something we still have to investigate. But that is at least one of the set of questions that we feel that the global initiative will be able to touch upon. Uh, so we think as numbers arise, when the data quality improves, uh, we, we will be able to address that research question. And, uh, and then there are some uh, open questions that are currently not uh, or outside the scope of the initiative. Um, and a very important one there is, um, does pe do people with MS, are they more susceptible of getting the virus? Uh, so what we currently now did is that, so we include all the patients that are suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases, and then we investigate the risk to be hospitalized or in ICU or in death, which of course is uh, one of the most important critical questions because investigating who, who gets the virus and who is more sensitive is much more complicated uh, to address, even in the general population, right? Because you can go to a supermarket and just grab the long grapefruit, the wrong grapefruit, uh, whereas somebody can be having a party with 50 people and have nothing. So susceptibility to, to the virus is, is very diff difficult. It is highly dependent on um, the behavior of people as well as the, the, the local policies in the individual countries. So you really need very high quality population based registries to touch upon those research questions. And we believe that there are indeed some within the network who will be focusing on, on those specific research questions. And then indeed to touch upon uh, research questions like vaccine readiness or how we respond to that. Uh, that is definitely something that we would like to touch upon uh, with the community and, and again reassess maybe the variables that we originally defined because if you go back to the slide that I previously shared um, we didn't touch upon vaccine readiness because at that time we were not even thinking about a vaccine um, and because we only had 48 hours to come up with a list of variables uh, we of course didn't think about very specific research questions where you need specific variables um, similarly, there will be a lot of questions on what was the effect of COVID-19 on uh, the progression long term. Uh, we will have to reevaluate how we look at those questions. How did COVID-19 affect it? Um, how people felt, were they more isolated, were they feeling depressed? How did they cope with, with, with handling uh, the pandemic as a community? So all of these questions are uh, possible from a technical point of view, and that is already very reassuring uh, that we proved how we can make it work. Uh, and I think that it will definitely make us more confident to touch upon new research questions uh, and actually to redo, although that we might be tired, but that's fine, <laughs> uh, to redo some of these pipelines uh, for, for other uh, questions. And I think that's also why we would like to keep the debate with the community very open. Uh, and that's also why we have on our website a link where, where the community can post other research questions or advice. So we really would like to have a public debate with the community. What do we feel are urgent questions? What are we going to prioritize and how can we adapt and learn while we grow? And we always mentioned that uh, in the beginning. So specifically, Claire was very passionate that we will learn while we go. Uh, and, and which is actually a completely new dynamic of handling a research project, right? As professors, we are so used to overthinking for so long. Uh, whereas here, we just... <laughs> immediately jumped into it and we will say, okay, whatever, we will learn while we go. Uh, and touching upon the vaccine question, I think is very inspiring, at least to me, and I would be very open to do so. But first, we will finish <laughs> what we started in, in, in the upcoming months and, and really touch upon the risk for individual uh, DMT and try to deliver that research question to the, the best of our abilities. Uh, yeah. Mm. So, and we were, uh, you were mentioning some, some points, I mentioned vaccines again, but let's say that 
well, in the case that, that, that the virus is like this pandemic will turn into something else, more of like an endemic or like more of a, you know, that's the new normality, right, in, in living with it. Like, will, will, do you think that there'll be, uh, what new measures will, will arise for, for people with MS and, and in general, maybe for, for Pablo, like related to the vaccine, like until we have the vaccine and after that, do you see like any possible changes in, the, in, the, in these measures? What will be the consequence? Yeah, okay, definitely. Uh, first say that the, in this uh, six months that we have been with the epidemics, we have learned a lot in terms of how to treat patients with uh, severe infect, infections, meaning in terms of uh, making use of some antiviral uh, drugs or uh, anti-inflammatory drugs because of the complication. Uh, meaning this, uh, this uh, curve of uh, improving knowledge has happened and, and right now uh, physicians know better how to treat patients and for the reason the severity, let's say, is, um, uh, you know, uh, being controlled to some extent. Uh, but definitely the, the vaccine is the one that is going to make the, the difference. But, you know, the vaccine is not a black and white uh, solution at present, meaning uh, after the release of the first uh, vaccines, uh, we need to learn uh, based in the technology or based in the characteristics of the, of the individual, uh, which is the more efficient or which one responds better. And then there is some log logistic aspects like producing vaccines for everybody, meaning uh, this is not possible and, and at present and it's going to take some time, meaning we're going to see that at the beginning we're going to vaccinate uh, healthcare professional people at, uh, with very high risk or, or and after that it's going to move to the, to the rest of the population, meaning that Yes, we're going to see a, a change in the management of, of, um, of the disease and vaccines by far is the, the best uh, solution, um, but uh, it's going to take some time, meaning that probably this is going to be a, a process that we are going to develop and learn for, let's say, a couple of years at least. And uh, like, well, and another process of developing treatments and vaccines are, are clinical trials, right? Like they, they are in some way being affected as well by the, by, by the pandemic. But is, is it more than, than delays, do you think? Or, or is it mainly about the logistics? Or is, uh, is there any other concerns to, to, to consider? Yeah, in terms of the impact of, uh, of the coronavirus infection in, in the clinical trials has been yeah, important and, and, and diverse. Let's say that the main uh, bottleneck were not the, the medical center, were the regulatory agencies, meaning they have received a massive uh, a amount of, of requests for studies, meaning that um, all the agencies put the priority in the coronavirus, meaning any other protocol was put on hold, meaning this is... Uh, uh, the main cause of, of delays. After that, you know, ethical committees, the, more or less the same thing that the regulatory agencies. And after that, the medical center. But the medical center will say that once uh, we have uh, uh, surpassed the, the first wave, the peak of the epidemics, uh, I will say that most of the medical center now have been able to resume uh, clinical activities. Taking, uh, keep in mind that, you know, at the peak of the epidemics, every time that a patient went to a MRI, you need to disinfect the MRI, meaning this introduced uh, additional delays, restrictions, risk, meaning these kind of things uh, should be taken in consideration. At the same time, you know, patients uh, were also a little bit concerned of keep going in clinical trials if this may impose additional risk. I would say that now um, trials are coming back to not normality, but, you know, being resumed to some extent. And, and of course, there are some other challenges. Let's say that for sure, at the time of analyzing the results of clinical trials, now we need to add an, a, a, a new variable, which is going to be the coronavirus, meaning we don't know um, how much a given, uh, for a given disease and a given treatment, the, the, the infection itself or everything that's wrong the infection may have introduced some uh, bias in, in the trial and this need to be considered. Mm. And uh, well, we are about to run out of time just uh, from the attendees. If anybody has any, any last question, the really nice last question. And uh, yeah, and have you seen like, so there's like increasing data from, uh, from the initiative, like from different countries, like, uh, is it anything, any differences between the, the different countries or it's not conclusive yet? 
like our meaning we need more data need more data like uh, what do you see for now there or maybe elizabeth uh, yeah elizabeth okay. or claire yeah <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. yeah yeah so we can clearly see differences across uh the initiative uh so so that is definitely something uh, that that we have to take into account in this in in, in the analysis approach uh, that there is a high variability um, across the initiatives uh, and the reasons are many right uh, so it is that they have different ways of activating their um, their participants or just because uh, in that country MS patients are generally older or they are generally more on that specific DMT because um, others are not reimbursed. So, so there are many differences why um, uh, the, the registries are different. Uh, and we believe that is one of the main reasons why indeed collaboration is required. Uh, because of course, but we can only talk about true signals if the signal is robust enough to survive sensitivity analysis across the different registries. Uh, and, and ideally the individual cohorts are large enough. Um, that's also why we, we really believe that pushing the data collection to the existing registries was the only sustainable way forward. Um, so yes, there is definitely difference across uh, the, um, the different um, initiatives and we feel that we have found a way in our, uh, to cope with it in the analysis um, and indeed the main take home question is we need more data mm -hmm. uh, so that is definitely yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, yeah. the last comment <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, now looking at the at the poll results like it's uh, I think yeah looking at it almost half of the of the people are doing um you know research in ms so 12 of those spread the words that we need more data so that we can also contribute to it and uh, i think also like you know well almost a third or a bit more than a third of the people have ms or, or have a relative like me. in my case as well I have, I have a relative without covid but with ms so like also ask all of those to to help and spread the word and and, and do your uh, contribution in and the more data we have the more uh, information and insights can extract to help to help everybody and uh, oh, we do have one last question yeah if, uh, well related to like how does COVID af affect the evolution of, of MS and maybe if I just ex uh, ex ex extrapolates to, to a bigger question like maybe for Pavel like you know, very quickly like uh, do you see any any in research like any results on and actually changes brain changes or implications from from the from the virus yeah no, not so far so far nobody has report any case of in which the disease has worsened because of having passed the mm -hmm. uh, super coronavirus and this is good but the long-term um, effects of the coronavirus in, uh, in ms and other autoimmune diseases is mm -hmm. going to require years of, of studies uh, you know, remember that, you know, MS and maybe other diseases are diseases that are increasing in frequency, but not in severity, uh, because the, our style of life and, and the exposition to, to viruses um, and infections in general, meaning, of course, it's a big pandemic um, and we need to consider that. And this is a call uh, for the evolution of, of this initiative now has been a bottom up. Everybody likes to contribute. Now, in order to solve these kind of questions, are going to require a coordinate uh, uh, activity, and uh, you know, merging most of these activities, designing the right uh, study design in order to be able to answer this question, because this is going to require some time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm at least we have saying uh, collecting big data, and, and especially not the numbers of the data, but the quality of the data is going to be critical in order to answer this question. But so far, we haven't seen. Uh, that the disease is doing worse because the coronavirus. Okay. Okay, so, so. Um, there was a really interesting paper yeah. just published today, actually, in Brain from um, data from UCL in London, looking at the neurological implications in um, a small case study series of about 45 people. Um, they don't specifically look at MS, but there's quite a lot of neuroinflammatory neuro um, symptoms and signals. So. I definitely think it's one we need to watch um, and we need to, we need to follow up the long term implications on COVID survivors because at the moment it's a complete unknown, but the data 
data will get us there eventually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Being agile and get data and, and measurements and and to be able to you know way predict and, and the future. So uh, that's that's a good wrap up, I think. So thank thank you everybody. Uh, thank you the, again to the excellent panelists and to all the attendees for your questions. And uh, I, I I hope and I believe that it's been uh, at least has been an interesting discussion for me and. Uh, yeah, like let's all do our, you know, our little help contribution as much as we can, and to figure out uh, you know, the, this pandemic and, and implication to 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 the people and to the people with the, with MS in this particular case. So once again, thank you everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. And see you. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Okay. Have a good day.